growing up. Um, but those are my favorites. You know, I just I'm always up for that stuff. Like Thor. You know, when Jason was talking about doing Thor, and you're like, do that. You know, do that because that's going to be epic. Because I I, lo I I love I don't know I love when people take characters that I think I know as well as you know possible and then do something completely completely unexpected it's still like Superior Spider-Man. I remember talking to Slot about it and, and being like, you know, when he was doing it, not before, but, um, and being like, God, this story, on paper, I would hate this story. This is so Dr. Octopus, you know, and brain switching. And then you read it and you realize it's a love letter to Peter Parker about why Peter Parker can be the only Spider-Man in your life. It's brilliant, you know, and so yeah, so those are the things that I would say I would say is my kind of big Batman DNA. Uh, you, you decided to reveal what happened to Bruce after the Joker fight through Alfred. How or why? What was your thought process to choose that device to reveal what happened to Bruce? Well, I love Alfred. She asked why did I use Alfred to show what happened to Bruce in 43. And Alfred to me is like the heart and soul of the Bat mythology. And he's the parent. And as a dad, I relate to Alfred so often. And as, as, as a kid, I relate to Bruce. You know, as a son, I mean. And Alfred to me is the one that just is endlessly tragic. You know, I love him, but he's such an enabler in so many ways, too, where he wants Bruce to be happy, and he knows this is the only thing that's going to make him happy, but he's in for so much pain with it. And there's a very painful scene coming with Alfred where, spoiler, I'll give it to you, but the, I just have this scene in my mind, it's not even written yet, but where Bruce is going to eventually, obviously, come back. I mean, right? I mean, you guys, are, like, it's not going to be more than that. It's not going to be more than and Super Heavy was never planned as this long epic, I'll tell you this, like, oddly enough, like, it's doing well enough, and you guys have been supportive enough that they, they're, they talk to me a lot about extending it, um, but I don't feel, I don't want to do that, I like, I like the shape of the story as it is, and I really, I, to, I told them, I called them up, and I was like, you know, um, should I keep going with this? And then I was like, no, this is a story, it's a story, I know the ending, and I know it's all about something, it's, it's a story, like, Court of Owls was a story, you know, Corvallis was the same, like, hey, I will keep this owl thing going a while, you know? It's like, no, it's a book, it's done. Like, it's, I don't want to keep it going. I want it to make, I want it to sit on the shelf as, as a meditation on something. And that's what this is. And, and um, Alfred sees Bruce when he comes back, and before he turns back, he just wants to, to look at him, to look at his back, because it's unscarred, because he was healed. And he just, he just wants to hold him and look at him for a minute as a son before he gets all those scars. Yeah, he, know, he knows he'll get them back, you know, all the terrible things that are going to happen to him as Batman again. And he just looks at his back and just, can you give me a minute, you know, just looking, looking at you, my son, before you go back and change back, and all the torture and pain I'm going to see on you again. And so Alfred, for me, is the heart that way, you know, and very, very, I love that character. Sorry, I cut off his hand. He'll get it back. <laughs> but um, he... He's that, he's that tortured parent. You're watching your kid do something that you know you don't want them to do. It's like with my kid, I just fear my kid's gonna be, he loves wrestling. He just started loving wrestling and I have followed him down this rabbit hole and like take him to WWE and all this stuff. And he's like, I wanna be a wrestler when I grow up, Dad. And I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, please don't. You know, because you like, <laughs> don't want to see them hurt. You know, my biggest fear is he'll be like, I want to be an MMA fighter, Dad. And I'll have to be at the cage, you know, like the octagon in the front, being like, yeah. You know, like, 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 please, like, you know. And, and then sometimes he wants to be a writing nerd like me. And, you know, that terrifies me. But it's the, it's the, the Alfred to me is the lens of the parent watching as you see your kid do something, you just want them to be happy. And they're doing something, you're like, God, this is not going to work out, but it makes them happy and I'm going to support them. And it's so sad. And yet, actually, Alfred plays a very, the whole, that whole idea of Alfred, not to get too spoilery, because I don't want to give too much away, plays a very big part in some future stuff I want to do with Sean Murphy and stuff like that, too. You're back in the yellow hat. That's you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is there any other property? Yeah, a ton, man. I want to work on Wonder Woman. Really bad. I want to work. I just, I literally, I would have already taken Wonder Woman. Not, I'm not taken it like in the way that I, you know, I am totally supportive of what David and Meredith are doing. I mean, before they took it, um, even before they did it, there are many points where I almost did it, and I just, I honestly, I know that I do not have the bandwidth to do it the way I want to do it, where I can focus all my attention on that book. And I have a whole idea of the mythology and everything, but I just, 
I know it. I'll be. I can't do it half-assed. And it, while I'm while I'm doing Batman the way I'm doing it, and I'm, I really want to. I want to do a couple stories on Batman still if I can swing it and figure it out. Depending on stuff with Greg and all that, and and all of it. Like if I can do these stories, I feel like you guys would be really, really happy with what's coming. Um, and I'm I'm really happy with it if I can do it. So I just don't have the bandwidth to do that. And witches and American Vampire. Um, and uh, AD, which I'm working on with Jeff Lemire. I'm just too old, honestly, at this point. When I was, I just look back and it's only five years ago that I was working on like five books and I'm like, yeah. But when I look back, the truth is it really hurt my marriage and it hurt my relationship with my kids when I was working that much. And as, as excited as I get about like, wouldn't it be great to take Wonder Woman and use some artist that love, you know, like if I could get a Sarah Kelly or Olivia Coppiel or someone like that, just, I'd love that. But even now, even if that was possible, I just couldn't do it. But there are a lot. There's that, Justice League, and Spider-Man. I mean, there's a lot. You know, Captain America is, I'd love to do one day, Ghost Rider. So there's there's a bunch, you know, there's a bunch. But I like to try and really balance it with Creator Own, man. I mean, Creator Own right now, it's it's such, I really, I, the one time I was really unhappy working in comics was when I was only on Superman Unchained and Batman. And that sounds awful because working with Jim Lee, and you get a phone call from Jim Lee, and I still like, I saw that it was like, Jim Lee, you know? And you're like, Jim Lee's calling me. Like, it was so, it was so, and Jim Lee is like a magical dude, I have to say, by the way. I will tell the story about Jim Lee, where last year in San Diego, I wanted to go to this, I was doing these interviews with him, and I wanted to go to this Godzilla thing. Have I told you this story? I wanted to go to the Godzilla experience, because I'm a huge Godzilla nerd. And it was all sold out, and Jim was like, I hang on, we were like doing some interviews. He's like, people boop, boop, and he's like, we have tickets. And I was like, wow, awesome, Jim, you're the best. And he's like, run over, go over there, I'll meet up with you. You know, I'm gonna finish this interview stuff, and I'll meet you there. And I'm like, yes. And I like huffed and ran, it was like five blocks away, and I just ran right there, and Jim was already there. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like how did you get over here? And he's like, what do you mean, I just walked. And I was like, oh my god. And I know, I know to this day, I made a, a straight line. I could see the place, like from where I was. It wasn't like I did like a loop deal. <laughs> so the lesson is, Jim Lee is magic. Always. Um, but I was like working on this thing with Jim Lee, and that's like a dream job. And I was working with Greg and doing Zero Year, and it was my favorite thing. And I didn't have any creator own because it was in between The Wake and this other stuff. And uh, American Vampire was on hiatus except Raffle wanted some time, and I wanted some time. And I got really depressed, really nervous. And I, it's like I had dream jobs, but when you don't have a place to go, for me at least, when I don't have a place to go that's totally my own, where I know everything better than anybody because I'm making it up, and it's a place to explore without the pressures and the restrictions of, of, of big two comics. It doesn't work for me, so if I didn't have that, I could probably try another superhero book, but it's just an unhealthy balance for me. I need to have creator own really be a priority for me right now, just for both my mental health and for, it keeps me fresh and young, you know, to try challenging things. Like, I'm doing a graphic novel right now, it's book After Death with Lemire. And it's part prose, and it's part visual, and it's different than anything I tried. And I think it's, I'm looking at it like it might be one of the best things I've done. Or it could be awful, I have no idea, I can't tell yet. Um, but, um, you know, it's those challenges that I feel like the balance of those things that keeps you, what keeps me vibrant and exciting to myself, you know. Back over there. Hi. I would say, she was saying, what, what advice would I give to writers trying to write their own graphic novel? I would just say this, like, today it's easier than it ever has been to make your own comics. And when I was a kid, I mean, I think there was this kind of idea that you would pitch to Big Two and you would go and pitch ideas. They really don't accept that stuff anymore if they ever did. It's really what they want is to see you at a con like this with your comic giving it to people and showing that you, you have the tenacity to produce something, whether it's digital or print, and that you've put something together that really shows your voice, whatever that voice is. And don't, don't do stories with their characters, they don't want to see that. They want to see you make something that's original, that's yours, they're looking for new talent all the time. You know, there's people whose, whose job is that. Um, so what they want to see is you out of booth here with a comic that you've made, you know, um, promoting it and giving it away and giving it to editors or selling it to them and, and having some level of, I guess, of, of success in that regard where it sounds like a paradox, like you have to make a comic to be able to make comics, but it really is that way where it's your resume is your thing that you make. And, and that's what I'd say. It's like, you know, writing, writing, doing it, even a 10 page thing or a, something where you say, this is, this is my voice and this, this is what I care about and this is how I write. Obviously, there are a lot of DC movies coming out soon. And so I just had a question. If Zack Snyder or Ben 
times like ask you to look at their Batman movies, you know, <laughs> think a little bit about it, and you know, help them write or, or just talk about it. Would you accept that, or would you like to stay in comics and you know, let the movies go off? Oh, if I had to choose between them? I would, I would stay in comics if I had to choose. I, I'm waiting for you to be like, I am Zack Snyder. <laughs> Actually, movies. <laughs> um, no, I'd stay in comics. I love it. I don't, I've never had any interest in, in writing for film or television, really. Um, and I've, I have offers now to do that stuff, and it's not, it's just not appealing to me yet. I mean, maybe one day I'd like to try that. I mean, look, if they came to me and said, do you want to read the Batman script and help on the Batman script specifically, of course I would. I would love, I would love that, you know, or that would be a dream. But that's a particular project that I, I feel like of course, it would be an honor to shepherd the character that we work on in comics to, into film. Um, but if you're asking sort of, am I like waiting in some way to make that transition, I'm not. And, and I, I have, you know, lucky right now, I mean, one of the great things about comics is their TV and film are desperate for, for properties. And it's a great time to be doing independent stuff where a lot of it, like witches and that stuff, gets snapped up. And so those offers and that, that world is, is there, I think, once you start to get your feet in the door, as they'll tell you too. But um, as a career change or something like that, I, I have no interest in doing that. I really love writing comics. And I don't know, I love them. I'm an idiot, but I, I love this. Yeah, I was, I was just wondering, you've been, maybe you've been acting a couple times already. Uh, I was just wondering, what was the inspiration or the story behind giving Bruce Wayne uh, a brother? Oh. Quarter Vowels, uh... The idea was, what was inspiration for giving him a brother? Um, Quarter Vowels for me was like, first of all, it was like terrifying. Cause it was the first time I ever wrote Bruce, and Dick was so easy to write. Cause he just, also, the fun thing about Dick is that all you have to do is like throw in a couple butt shots once in a while, and everybody is super happy. <laughs> <laughs> Like, and that was the weirdest thing was when I was writing Dick Grayson, like I would get all these requests where it was like, could you please give us more like shirtless Dick Grayson and more, you know, butt shots of Dick Grayson? And I was like, this is a very serious book. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I was like so baffled by this. And then at the end, I totally got it. And I was like, oh yeah, I get it. All right, sure. And I was like, Jock, throw in the, you know, butt shot. But it was always like now he's being killed, like it's the end of the story where it's like murderously hard on him. But when I was writing Bruce, and that's one of the fun things about Bruce right now, is I, I was teasing the Grayson guys, I was like, we're going for our own version of sexy, because Bruce can never compete with Dick, where I'm always like, I'm always like, oh man, you know, Bruce Wayne is really, really sexy, man. Like, look, I'm gonna, I did one in Zero Year, he has a, like, a, a panel I remember where he's like pretty much naked. And I was like, ah, oh, something coming in. You know, like for eye candy and, and no one cared, it was just like me. And I'm like, what the hell, because everyone's like, Grayson. And so Bruce can't compete with Dick that way. Dick's like a different, but he's in, in super heavy is a whole different kind of sexiness. He's got a beard, he's shaggy, he's like a man, he's like a man. And obviously he's a man, he's like a man's man. And that I really, <laughs> Greg, wait till you see, oh my God. I said, remember I said oh, yeah. this, I sent yeah. this image to him. I was like, in 46, he has his first like sex scene that I've ever given him ever. And I feel bad I've never given him any romance or anything. And it's basically, he's like, has a, a shower scene. And I sent it to him and I'm like, I look at this. No, it's not racy or anything. It's just that he's so handsome, and you're like, oh my lord. And the and the and Julie, it's like it's really like. I, anyway, the the whole thing was like uh, um, I, with Dick. It was so easy to write him because he was so emotional. And with Bruce, it was I was so terrified with Court of Vowels because I was like, ah, oh, it's so fun. Bruce, you know, Dick and I are friends, and he just talks about everything. And he's like me, and he just goes on, and it's like Bruce is like, shut up. You know what I mean? You're like. Bruce does not talk about his feelings. You got Alfred now being like, how do you feel? And he's like, her. You know, and you're like, huh? Where do I get any of my stuff? And Court of Owls was then my way of saying, Bruce can't be that tough. He has to, if he knows the city this well, growing up in New York, one of the things that always fascinated me and still fascinates me about, you know, Gotham and all of this is its history. The idea that I grew up in the Lower East Side and my friends and I used to love to go down to Chinatown and that stuff and we would get, and 80s and fake IDs and all that stuff, you know, Chinatown. I had a belt with a Chinese star that I bought there. I was this little fat kid, it was just the worst. But anyway, the, I like look back and like, what were you thinking with any of this? But the point is, um, I always was fascinated, even as a kid, by the kind of haunted quality of old neighborhoods. I feel like so many places in America, cities are just built for now, they're built for you, like where I live, where I used to live in the suburbs. It's like everything seems like it's built for your generation. But you go to places that are older in cities like Baltimore or Philadelphia or New York or Boston and you see these generations that must have lived there before you in the cobblestones and all that. And I'm like, so Bruce, I was always thinking, I'm like, Batman knows the city. He knows every inch of it. He knows the politics. He knows this. 
but you didn't know it five years ago because it changes really fast. And you won't know it 10 years from now, and you can't have known it 20 years ago. So what if I can kind of weaponize that history and say, you're not as great as you think you are because you might know the city right now, but you don't know it 10 years ago or 20 years ago. It was different people with different dreams, different broken dreams, different achievements, all of it. And that's how that kind of came about. And the brother aspect was about how do I build a mystery? That's kind of how I write. So I have an idea, and then I'll be like, how do I make that idea flesh? I'll be like, well, I want to create a, if I want to show Bruce that he doesn't know the city, I got to start big, like a legend or something that he thinks is he's investigated that's untrue and it seems true, then it's like, well, that legend has bases in Wayne buildings, okay, it's closer to him, he knows less. Well, actually, it has a history with his family, or it has a history with Dick Grayson. How could he not have known that? It's actually right under his feet. His own parents might be connected to it through, his, you know, through this stuff. So it's, it's figuring out what your story's about. Like, I figure out what it's about for me, like Super Heavy is a totally different structure. It's about what does Batman mean to us in the real world when we have these problems that he cannot solve as one person. Does he mean anything or is he a failed experiment? And so I'm constructing a story where you build a different, how do I get to that point? And you think about how you plot it, how you do it so you can be the most painfully resonant sort of um, ending of that somehow. And so for Court of Owls, it was bringing it closer and closer and closer until he literally realizes that under his feet in his own buildings, his own family, there's mysteries he doesn't know about. Does that make sense? How much of his work from Spawn and the Violator did you kind of try to incorporate with the Joker? I don't really, he asked how much of Greg's previous work like Spawn and Violator I, I, I incorporate. I don't really incorporate um, any of it. Greg and I just have our own rapport where I know what he likes to draw and he knows what I like to write and we found like a great balance where we're constantly sort of like, hey, do you want to draw this? No, I want to draw that? No, all right. And it's really fun. I mean, one of the great things about working with different artists is like, I love trying to write a story about Batman to get, like, like 44 is the same stuff in Super Heavy, but it's done for Jock because that's, he wouldn't draw the stuff in Super Heavy, it wouldn't appeal to him. So it's the same material, but it's, that's what I would write, how I write it for Jock as opposed to for Greg, where it's robots and monsters, whatever. So if I worked with, you know, Fiona Staples, I would write differently, Batman for her. Uh, if I worked with Tim Sale or, you know, Latour, each one of those people, I, I'd still try and get to the same material I wanted to talk about, but construct a story that sh lets them shine and works its way through the, the, their, their artistic sort of vision. So it might look wildly different. You know, I might, if I was working with one artist, I might use Arkham villains, and with another, I might use street villains. But the same point in each story, you know? Does that make sense? Makes sense. Fetter for a while. Sorry. A Wonder Woman Batman romance, man. I, I feel I feel I would feel good about that. I think I would feel good about that. I mean, I I I I, 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 I have a, I have an idea, not a romance, but a team up. One of the stories I want to do is a team up between them. And as I was thinking about them, they do kind of have a weird vibe. They have a vibe, you know. I don't know. I can see it. I can see it. I don't know. I, you know, I really I just avoid. I don't know why I avoid romance so deeply. Batman. I think it's because I always feel like you know it's going to end badly, and so it always feels like you're setting it up to fail, where it's like, you know, oh, uh, this person's going to turn out to be a villain, or this person's going to be dead, and that will, you know, and, the face. Right, or whatever. And I try really hard to avoid that stuff, so even the romance we're doing now with Julie, um, I'm trying hard to sort of avoid, avoid a lot of those tropes, and make it something that's a little bit more a little bit more meaty where this is a Bruce who basically is the boy who never got the chance to live. He's free of Batman and he's living his life without those scars and who would he be? And this is the kind of person I think that that inspires him because she does the same kind of work that, that Batman does but in a real human way. You know, she wants the city to be better and she she's a very um, dedicated person that way and that trying to create a real romance for me is a lot of fun and I can see it between them, I could. I could see it. Now I'm thinking about it. Let's see. <laughs> In the back. Yep. No problem. I also wonder when was my first crush ever. <laughs> Linda Carter was like literally like my absolute first crush. I've told this before him, but I always had this fear. Like I had this like as little like teenager, I always had this fear that she would lasso me with her lasso, and then I'd have to tell her I loved her. You know, yeah, I mean, tell the truth. You know what I mean? And you're like, oh my god, I love you. 
but I don't want to tell you that. <laughs> it's also really to be awful. So anyway. So the, uh, the writers and producers of the Gotham TV show have said that they have definite plans for the Rebels who are playing them in the evolution of the show. How does that feel that characters that she makes a couple of years ago are about to make their first like screen appearance, not just like the action superhero movie? series that really concentrates on the city that you yourself have such a strong understanding connection. Thanks. It's, it was a huge thrill, actually. Jeff Johns told me a little bit before that announcement that the um, uh, that, that was coming, and we've, we've become closer over the last couple of years. It's been a real uh, pleasure uh, to get to talk to him more about stuff. And he told me, and I was just over the moon, I was like, I have one stipulation. I was like, I get to be an owl in the back. Great. And then you don't know me the owl. It's like, <laughs> um, and just ruin the whole scene. But I, I couldn't be more thrilled, honestly. I mean, you, you, Batman to me is like when I started reading Batman. Batman, I, here's my worry about Batman. Like, one of the truth, he's my favorite character in the world. And a lot of people like like Grant, right? Grant is when Grant came on Batman. Grant is Grant Morrison. You know what I'm saying? Like, he has built his whole library. And you, you there's no, there's no real risk in Batman for him. And he's gonna make it awesome. But he also is already Grant Morrison, and there's a million things he's done that are amazing already, and he's cut his teeth, and he's a, he's a master. I, I I was nobody. I had no no. I had to ask Jock how many panels a page a lot of the time. On I was so new on Detective, and luckily these guys were huge mentors to me, Jock and all of them. And you know now it's sort of different where people are like, oh yeah, Scott Snyder and Jock and. But I was just remember, like I had to convince Jock to do it. I, I went to a bar in San Diego and like was drinking with him desperately, trying to get him to do that story. And I was no one. And so the thing I worry about a lot on Batman, I, I worry that there are days I just know I'm going to be a better writer in five years, in ten years, and that I'm, I'm doing my favorite character first. And I'm trying really hard. I promise, like <laughs> really hard, to leave everything like out there and just give it everything I have and do stories that every story has to be like I said it has to be the story I pick up and read but it also has to be a story that's personal you know I, that's why I don't spin my wheels on the book or not spin my wheels but that's why I avoid doing small stuff is because every time I feel like you want to do the story that there's a million people that would kill you to do your job and they have a Batman story they're dying to tell that's their important story that's personal to them and if I'm going to take up room on this book I better have one like that my feeling, or move over and let someone else do it. And uh, ultimately, my fear is that I'm going to be a much better writer when I'm more experienced, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting my chance to do this book now when I'm still really green. I mean, I, I constantly feel like I'm like, oh God, like, you know, how did I make that mistake back there? And I wish I could, I wish I, but then I was, I, I was talking about this to Neil Gaiman, I'd only met him very briefly, and then I got to hang out with him at a Vertigo thing not long ago. Thrilled, and I was sitting with him, and he's just amazing to watch. Also, with his story, and he tells stories also just like you want him to. Where he was telling about the story about how he went to this shoe store in in London, and it was like this oldest shoe store in like London, and how they kept the molds of everybody's feet beneath the thing. And he's like, they call them lasts. You know, I won't do his accent because it always sounds like I'm doing like a Jamaican accent or something when I do like my British accent. And um, he was like, the last, the last of the dead. Are beneath, and they have Frank Sinatra's last, and they have this last, and it's like exactly the story you want to hear from Neil Gaiman, really, you know. <laughs> and um, but what he said, which was so great, he was like, Scott, Scott, Scott. He's like, because because I was telling him, you know, I told him that. And he's like, right now you're worried you're not good enough. In a few years, you'll worry you used to be better. <laughs> and I was sort of like, oh, okay, it never ends, does it? <laughs> it never ends. And I was like, all right, you know what, I get it. So that's, but that's my fear is I'm, I'm writing a character like I, I wish I had five, ten years to cut my teeth on characters coming up like where, where, you know, it was sort of books that were more under the radar, but I didn't. I, I feel like I got thrown into the giant spotlight, and you know, there's stuff I wish was better that I've done in different ways too. But I'm trying my best. All I can say, you know, I'm trying my best.
ways, I, I don't know, I just would like to hear, um, you know, he's going to have his right idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, in a lot of ways, he's kind of everything, all the fan, like all the ways you can't look at that man wrong, I guess. Yeah. And I'd love to hear you speak about that. Yeah, he was saying that Joker and Death of the Family is kind of, has a very sort of interesting relationship to Bruce and that he's almost as, he dis, he dis, he, he dis, uh, discards the Bruce Wayne persona entirely and stuff. And what I'd say, Joker, Joker's my favorite villain. I love writing Joker. And every time I'm like, I'm never going to write him again. I'm like, I have another idea for him. So I, have, I do, I'm actually kind of tinkering with the graphic novel with him right now. But the thing that I love about him, everybody has their own iteration. I love Grant. I love, my iteration of him is that he is kind of like the devil to Bruce. And what, what he's saying is, he sees what you're afraid is true about yourself. And then he makes that thing true or says, I know that it's true. I'll show you it's true. And I think what Bruce, for me and Death of the Family, he's afraid in some ways that these relationships he's made and his family he's built is somehow making him vulnerable and mortal. And Joker's like, you got into this business to be a legend, to be immortal. And that's what all your villains have done. We all have transformed ourselves into these things in your honor. We are your royal court, and I am the jester, the hand to the king. You need to come back to what you always thought you should be. And Bruce denies that. And then Endgame is sort of like, I'm going to show you how big you could have been and how big I am. And I invited you into this, and you rejected me. And now you're going to see how small and mortal and human and ineffective and meaningless you are. So it's one big arc. And ultimately, that's about my anxieties. I mean, the thing that I worry about the most when I'm in a black place is like, what is the point of all of it? Like, what? What, what, you know, you, you feel yourself inching towards, you know, death and all of it. And, and, and it, it's like, it's when you feel bad or I feel bad, it's like standing on a frozen lake is the best way I can describe it. Everybody else is having fun skating, and all you can think about is what's beneath and it's going to crack at any moment or melt or whatever. And Joker to me is saying to Bruce, he's reminding him of his own mortality. That's the point. He's saying, everything you do is meaningless. Every relationship, every, you try and fix the city, it doesn't work. In 10 years, it'll be back. It's all sand. But I'm the one that laughs at you for that. And ultimately, what Bruce is saying is, and this is why what I meant earlier, reason inspiration, like for, for bravery, kind of a post-9-11 environment, Bruce is saying everything matters. Make your life matter. Take tragedy. My parents died in a meaningless act. Like, as almost meaningless as it can come over nothing. You know, over pearls, over nothing. Uh, no big conspiracy. I'm going to take this thing that's meaninglessness at its core and turn it into an engine of meaning where I'm going to be someone that says, make your life matter, make what you do affect people and affect the world every day, and don't be afraid that all that means nothing. And that's that's kind of my joker, you know, is that he's like, oh, it means nothing. You know, and he'll always be there haunting him that way. And they're locked in this battle of of meaning and meaninglessness, of purpose and, you know, and void and absence of that. Does it because that's his compass, and I love that about him. And he 
seems to all of us, of course he's doing the right thing. But when you look at what he's doing, it's actually, it is the right thing, meaning morally. But it doesn't make a lot of sense in terms of, he's, he's doomed, he's doomed. Like, he's doomed for all of it to come crashing down. But he says, I don't care. I'm doing what I think is right, right now. And that's what I connect to, is that sense of, of purpose and, and this kind of ethical compass that's private that you say, this is what I'm doing to, to make life make sense to myself. And I don't care if it makes sense to nobody else but me.